Today, anyone entering the old meeting house cannot help but be impressed by the stained glass windows, the oak panelling and the plaques commemorating the great and good of the 19th and 20th century. But not many people will have noticed the two brass plaques on the screen behind the communion table. The verses on these plaques read as follows. In memory of the conscientious sacrifices and Christian labours of the Reverend Robert Porter, Vicar of Pentridge, the Reverend John Whitlock, MA, Vicar of St Mary's Nottingham, the Reverend William Reynolds, MA, lecturer at the same church, the Reverend John Billingsley, MA, Vicar of Chesterfield, the Reverend Joseph Truman, BD, Rector of Cromwell, the Reverend Robert Smalling, Vicar of Gressley, and others who resigned their livings when the Act of Uniformity was passed in 1662. Driven from their homes by the Oxford Act of 1666 and found in Mansfield a little resort, a shelter and sanctuary. And united in hearty love and concord, they worshipped together till the Act of Toleration was passed in 1688. When all who survived the day of persecution returned to their ministry, save the Reverend Robert Porter, who remained in charge of this congregation till his death in January 22nd, 1690. The meeting house erected AD 1702 for the exercise of religious worship was restored. Laos Deo. So let's take a closer look at the pioneers in Mansfield. The year is 1662 and the Act of Uniformity has just been passed. King Charles II has been restored to the throne in 1660 after the death of Oliver Cromwell in 1648. Charles was going to impose church uniformity by force if needs be. This act made the use of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer compulsory for all clergymen. Yet nearly 2,000 clergymen around the country refused to conform and either voluntarily left their dwellings or were forcibly removed from them. They became known as dissenters or nonconformists. This became known as the Great Ejection of 1662. Two other acts were quickly implemented on one, the Conventional Act of 1664 prohibited religious assemblies of more than five people, except in the Church of England. And the other was the Five Mile Act of 1665, which prohibited non-conforming clergymen coming within five miles of a parish from which they had been banished. This is the climate that a lot of religious groups found themselves in at the time. Firstly, why Mansfield? What attraction was here? What was in Mansfield in the 1660s that attracted eight of the original nonconformists to come here? The main reason is that Mansfield was not a corporate borough and would not be so for another 200 years. Nottingham and Lincoln were corporate boroughs, and so were Chesterfield and Newark. This meant that they could send an MP to Parliament. The Five Mile Act forbade them from preaching within a five mile radius of a borough. It imposed a fine of £40, £4,200 in today's money so far above a clergyman's wages. Of course, there are other factors too, to do with the sympathisers and the people being so friendly and welcoming much as they are today. Let's start with our main man, the Reverend Robert Porter. Robert Porter was the son of William Porter of Nottingham, a musician. He was born in 1624 and at 15 entered St. John's College, Cambridge. He graduated with a BA in 1643. 
1650, he was a re re resident vicar at Pentridge. He refused to take the oath in 1662 and was therefore ejected from his position. He remained there and he helped people in private. He preached in his own room, home, which would have been a dangerous thing to do. Sometimes he went by night or in the early hours to an obscure house miles away so that he wouldn't be caught. When he retired, he came to Mansfield and found a refuge there. He still sometimes visited his former flock, traveling at night and in some dangerous ways. He moved into the house, which is now known as the Porter House, which is at the bottom of the chapel yard. But we'll talk that, about that later. At Mansfield, he attended public services at St. Peter's Church and held his meetings privately at his house before or after that service. He was scholarly and very gifted and more of his writings might have been printed if only they could have deciphered his handwriting. He became the first leader of the fledgling nonconformist community at the Porter House which later moved into the old meeting house when it was built in 1702. It was because of this group that the old meeting house was built and the reason we can be here today. It was first named the meeting house, but when the Quakers moved into their building, that became the meeting house. So we changed to the old meeting house. People still assume we are Quakers because of the name. His, his actions started the green shoots of Unitarianism in Mansfield. He lived just long enough to see the dawn of better times for nonconformists, seeing the Toleration Act of 1689, which gave freedoms, but unfortunately not for Catholics and Unitarians. Wow, they must have thought we were a really wild bunch. He died on January the 22nd, 1690, and was survived by his wife and several children. The next two we want to talk about are the Reverend John Whitlock and Reverend William Reynolds. They were inseparable friends from their college days, right up to Reynolds' death. By Porter, and all the other ejected ministers at Mansfield, they were graduates of Cambridge. John Whitlock was the son of a London merchant born in 1624. Well educated, he gained a BA and an MA. William Reynolds was born in Suffolk in 1625. His father had business connections in Russia and the young William went there on family interests in 1664 for two years. On his return, he became vicar with his friend, John Whitlock. They preached in East Anglia and Cornwall. Then in 1651, they received an unexpected invite to settle together at St. Mary's Church, Nottingham, as vicar and lecturer. They accepted only on the condition that a full Presbyterian order was set up in the parish. Here, they are on the list of clergy. They were driven away in 1662 and taken in by Sir John Musters at Colwick Hall until 1665, and then they had to move five miles away. They found a temporary residence in Shybrook, but the awkwardness of travelling to Nottingham decided them in 1668 to move to Mansfield. If they had not taken the risk of registering to vote in Newark, which is a borough and therefore illegal for them, they would <coughs> not have been imprisoned. They were imprisoned in Nottingham in, until July 1685, 17 years, when they were moved to Hull. Fortunately for them, an order was given to return all Nottingham prisoners back to Nottingham. They were returned and after six months they were released. In 1687, they returned to live in Nottingham. John Whitlock had married in 1651 and had a son and a daughter. 
He became assistant minister to three ejected ministers, one of them being his great friend William Reynolds. And they founded High Pavement Congregation, Nottingham, in 1689. When he died in 1723, he was buried in St Mary's Church, Nottingham. The church he was originally ejected from, and there is a floor stone near to the pulpit as a memorial to him. He must have been very well thought of there. William Reynolds had married Susanna, the daughter of Richard Merrer, an alderman of Derby in 1652. An alderman, an alderman being a co-opted member of an English county or borough council next in status to a mayor. They had one daughter, Sarah, who married Samuel Coates of Warmington, Northamptonshire. He went on to succeed Robert Porter as minister in Mansfield in 1690. Though still we imagine meeting in the Porter House. Fourth we would like to talk about is the Reverend John Billington. He was born at Chatham in Kent in 1625. He gained his BA from Cambridge in 1648. He was ordained as a Presbyterian vicar at St Andrew's Understaff in London. As far as we know, he came to Chesterfield in about 1652. As we know, he married Mary, the daughter of Emmanuel Braun, the rector of Ashover at this time. Shortly after settling in Chesterfield, he, his father-in-law, and Robert Moore of Brampton, Chesterfield, began a dispute with James Naylor, a leader of the Quaker movement, who had reenacted Jesus riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He had rode into Bristol on a horse and proclaimed himself almost the new Messiah. It appears that didn't go very, down very well with Billingsley and his friends. John was very outspoken in his views and prayed publicly for King Charles II when it was a dangerous thing to do. This was before the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. We think that he preferred religious freedom under a king rather than under the Commonwealth Parliament. Many things had been promised before when Cromwell came to power, but few had materialized. He was present in July 1661 at the quarter sessions for neglecting to read from the Book of Common Prayer. He had become vicar of St. Mary's and All Saints Church at Chesterfield, better known as the Crooked Spire in 1653. On August the 23rd, 1662, he gave his final sermon in the spire, and in it he said, I quote, ministers, at least some, were put out for murder, drunkenness, boredom, etc. But such as himself for being too holy and too careful of religion. Powerful stuff. He appears on the list of clergy in the Crooked Spire, but in brackets it says intruded, just as a reminder of his dissension. The Five Mile Act necessitated his removal from Chesterfield. He took up residence in Mansfield, but still visited a group of nonconformists at Chesterfield by making the journey of 12 miles once a fortnight. When indulgence was granted in 1672, he was licensed in respect of his house in Mansfield and took out a general license as a preacher. He returned to Chesterfield as the first minister of Elder Yard Chapel. He died in 1683. In 2015, members of Rose Hill Baptist, St Andrew's United Reformed Church, and Elder Yard Unitarians in Chesterfield remembered the great ejection of clergy from the Church of England in 1662 with a prayer walk from the Crooked Spire via Elder Yard. At the Crooked Spire, Canon Michael Knight praised the integrity of John Billingsley, who chose to leave the church in obedience to the call of God. 
Maybe not quite how John saw it at the time. Not so much a choice as an enforced necessity. Now back to Mansfield. There's a property in the area of Westgate, not far from the old meeting house, known as Cromwell House. This house, we believe, has been here since around 1538. That would make it a contender for the oldest house still surviving in the centre of Mansfield. Its inner walls are of double thickness because it is claimed it originally provided hiding holes for those Catholic priests on the run. It was called Cromwell House after the Reverend John Cromwell, another one of our descendants, who in 1660s, living here, had been ejected from his living at Clayworth, just north of Retford. He was kept in prison in Newark between 1663 and 1666 on suspicion of re preaching rebellion. He came here in 1666 and for eight years before moving to Norwich, where he died in 1684, aged 53. As we said before, they had many supporters of high standing in the town. This enabled them to flourish. One of those, the Reverend John Firth, the Minister for Mansfield and Vicar of St. Peter's Church. He was a moderate man and obviously had some sympathy with their cause. Life would have been much harder without him. He welcomed them into his Sunday morning services at St. Peter's while they arranged their services and meetings later so as not to clash with his. By 1669, the church authorities were beginning to accept that non-conformity was not fading away, but was here to stay. Maybe people like Firth helped to endorse the acceptance by the Church of England. This was shown by his replies back to the Archbishop, who basically wanted to know how many non-conformists were in the parish and where and when they met. Firth played down his knowledge and said he, he did not know them well enough. He gave them information, but not about his friendship with them. Cromwell House also housed a school for boys between 10 and 13 years of age, between 1788 to well into the 1800s. The first superintendent of the school was Reverend Samuel Catlow. He was minister of this chapel from 1783 to 1798. His school prospered and the land in front of the house was laid out into building lots named Catlow Street. Here is a plaque to commemorate the where St. John's to commemorate it. When St. John's Church was built in 1837, it was renamed St. John Street. <clears throat> The old name sign at the bottom of the street still remains. The old meeting house still has connections with this street as our minister, Maria, lives on St. John Street. Let's now return to the Porter House. This is the house today. This house too is considered to be one of the oldest in Mansfield, thought to have been built around 1657. It was here we have heard a major meeting place for the non-conformists in 1666. If only the walls could speak, what a fantastic story they would be telling us. The house was still used for meetings until the building of the old meeting house in 1702. Samuel Brunts became a great friend of the dissenters. He was a broad-minded and tolerant man and he welcomed them and provided much needed financial support. A man born into wealth, his influence as a benefactor is still felt in the town today. An amount of £120 is still received each year from his trust for the old meeting house. In 1708, he became a trustee of the Porter House. Other trustees were members of the Sylvester family and Robert Dodsley, father of the writer and eminent publisher Robert Dodsley. Indeed, these were the men who provided the land and funds for the chapel to be built. 
The house continued as the parsonage and still remains the property of the old meeting house. Today it is occupied by United Response, who still provide a service to the people of Mansfield. They support adults and young people with disabilities to live the life they choose. We have only touched on the history of Mansfield Unitarianism today. The brave men who risked everything to bring it here. What a fascinating history this chapel has had and long may it continue.